In my youth in the trans sky, I listened to the elders of my tribe telling stories of the old days. Amongst the tales they related to me were those of wars fought by our ancestors in defense of the fatherland. The names of Dingane and Bambata, Moshweshwe and Sekukuni were praised as the glory of the entire African nation. I hoped then that life might offer me the opportunity to serve my people and make my own humble contribution to their freedom struggle. This is what has motivated me in all that I have done. Having said this, I must deal immediately with the question of violence. I do not deny that I planned sabotage. I did not plan it in a spirit of recklessness, nor because I have any love of violence. I planned it as a result of a calm and a sober assessment of the political situation that had arisen after many years of tyranny, exploitation and oppression of my people by the whites. I and the others who started the organization did so for two reasons. Firstly, we believed that as a result of government policy, violence by the African people had become inevitable and that unless responsible leadership was given to canalize and control the feelings of our people, there would be outbreaks of terrorism which would produce an intensity of bitterness and hostility between the various races of this country which is not produced even by war. Secondly, we felt that without violence, there would be no way open to the African people to succeed in their struggle against the principle of white supremacy. All lawful modes of expressing opposition to this principle had been closed by legislation. And we were placed in a position in which we had either to accept a permanent state of inferiority or to defy the government. We chose to defy the law. We first broke the law in a way which avoided any recourse to violence. When this form was legislated against, and then the government resorted to a show of force to crush oppositions to its policies, only then did we decide to answer violence with violence. But the violence which we chose to adopt was not terrorism. We who formed Umkonto Esizwe were all members of the African National Congress and had behind us the ANC tradition of non-violence and negotiation as a means of solving political disputes. We believe that South Africa belongs to all people who live in it and not to one group, be it black or white. We did not want an interracial war and tried to avoid it to the last minute. Already, scores of Africans had died as a result of racial friction. South Africa is the richest country in Africa and could be one of the richest countries in the world, but it is a land of extremes and remarkable contrasts. The whites enjoy what may well be the highest standard of living in the world, whilst Africans live in poverty and misery. 30% are laborers, labor tenants and squatters on white farms and work and live under conditions similar to those of the serfs in the Middle Ages. The complaint of Africans is not only that they are poor and the whites are rich, but that the laws which are made by the whites are designed to preserve this situation. There are two ways to break out of poverty. The first is by formal education. And the second is by the worker acquiring a greater skill at his work and thus higher wages. The present government has always sought to hamper Africans in their search for education. One of their early acts after coming into power was to stop subsidies for African school feeding. Many African children who attended schools depended on this supplement to their diet. There is compulsory education for all white children at virtually no cost to their parents, be they rich or poor. Similar facilities are not provided for the African children. In 1960 and 61, the per capita government spending on African students at state-aided schools was estimated at 
12 rands and 46 cents. In the same years, the per capita spending on white children in the Cape Province, which are the only figures available to me, was 144 rands and 57 cents. According to the Bantu Educational Journal, only 5,660 African children in the whole of South Africa passed their junior certificate in 1962. And in that year, only 362 passed matric. This is presumably consistent with the policy of Bantu education, about which the present Prime Minister said, When I have control of native education, I will reform it so that natives will be taught from childhood to realize that equality with Europeans is not for them. People who believe in equality are not desirable teachers for natives. When my department controls native education, it will know for what class of higher education a native is fitted and whether he will have a chance in life to use his knowledge. Africans who do obtain employment in the unskilled and semi-skilled occupations which are open to them are not allowed to form trade unions which have recognition under the Industrial Conciliation Act. This means that strikes of African workers are illegal and that they are denied the right of collective bargaining which is permitted to the better paid white workers. The discrimination in the policy of successive South African governments towards African workers is demonstrated by the so-called civilized labor policy under which sheltered, unskilled government jobs are found for those white workers who cannot make the grade in industry at wages which far exceed the earnings of the average African employee in industry. The government often answers its critics by saying that Africans in South Africa are economically better off than the inhabitants of the other countries in Africa. I do not know whether this statement is true and doubt whether any comparison can be made without having regard to the cost of living index in such countries. But even if it is true, as far as the African people are concerned, it is irrelevant. Our complaint is not that we are poor by comparison with people in other countries but that we are poor by comparison with the white people in our own country, and that we are prevented by legislation from altering this imbalance. The lack of human dignity experienced by Africans is the direct result of the policy of white supremacy. White supremacy implies black inferiority. Legislation designed to preserve white supremacy entrenches this notion. Menial tasks in South Africa are invariably performed by Africans. When anything has to be carried or cleaned, the white man will look around for an African to do it for him, whether the African is employed by him or not. Because of this sort of attitude, whites tend to regard Africans as a separate breed. They do not look upon them as people with the families of their own. They do not realize that they have emotions, that they fall in love like white people do, that they want to be with their wives and children like white people want to be with theirs, that they want to earn enough money to support their families properly, to feed and clothe them and send them to school. And what houseboy or garden boy or laborer can ever hope to do this? Pass laws, which to the Africans are among the most hated bits of legislation in South Africa, render any African liable to police surveillance at any time. I doubt whether there is a single African male in South Africa who has not at some stage had a brush with the police over his pass. Hundreds and thousands of Africans are thrown into jail each year under pass laws. Even worse than this is the fact that pass laws keep husband and wife apart and lead to the breakdown of family life. Poverty and the breakdown of family life have secondary effects. Children wander the streets of the townships because they have no schools to go to, or no money to enable them to go to school, or no parents at home to see that they go to school 
because both parents, if there be two, have to work to keep the family alive. This leads to a breakdown in moral standards, to an alarming rise in illegitimacy, and to growing violence which erupts not only politically, but everywhere. Life in the townships is dangerous. There is not a day that goes by without somebody being stabbed or assaulted, and violence is carried out of the townships into the white living areas. People are afraid to walk alone in the streets after dark. Housebreakings and robberies are increasing, despite the fact that the death sentence can now be imposed for such offenses. Death sentences cannot cure the festering sore. Africans want to be paid a living wage. Africans want to be allowed to live where they obtain work and not be endorsed out of an area because they were not born there. Africans want to be allowed to own land in places where they work and not to be obliged to live in rented houses which they can never call their own. Africans want to be part of the general population and not confined to living in their own ghettos. African men want to have their wives and children to live with them where they work and not be forced into an unnatural existence in men's hostels. African women want to be with their menfolk and not be left permanently widowed in the reserves. Africans want to be allowed out after 11 o'clock at night and not to be confined to their rooms like little children. Africans want to be allowed to travel in their own country and to seek work where they want to and not where the Labour Bureau tells them to. Africans want a just share in the whole of South Africa. They want security and a stake in society. Above all, we want equal political rights because without them, our disabilities will be permanent. I know this sounds revolutionary to the whites in this country because the majority of voters will be Africans. This makes the white man fear democracy. But this fear cannot be allowed to stand in the way of the only solution which will guarantee racial harmony and freedom for all. It is not true that the enfranchisement of all will result in racial domination. Political division based on color is entirely artificial. And when it disappears, so will the domination of one color group by another. The struggle is a truly national one. It is a struggle of the African people inspired by their own suffering and their own experience. It is a struggle for the right to live. During my lifetime, I have dedicated myself to this struggle of the African people. I have fought against white domination and I have fought against black domination. I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve. But if needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die.